You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to another edition of The Corbett Report. I am your host, James Corbett, podcasting to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan on the 19th of November, 2011. And, of course, I would like to welcome all of the listeners back to the podcast and invite you all, as always, to check into my websites, CorbettReport.com, ClimateGate.tv, and FukushimaUpdate.com. And, of course, from CorbettReport.com, you can find links to all of the other material and information that I present on a daily basis now at the website, including articles, interviews, and videos. And, of course, you can also find links to media ventures and media entities that I'm connected with or support, including, of course, MediaMonarchy.com. So, once again, of course, I would like to welcome all of you back to the podcast and thank you all for your support and all of your feedback and commentary that you continue to send in through CorbettReport.com slash contact. I'm trying to get to as many people as I can, but I just can't respond to it all, of course, as always. So if I haven't responded to your email, it's no personal offense. It's just I cannot physically respond to all of it. So on that note, once again, thank you all for your feedback and your support. It is all greatly appreciated in whatever form it comes. But today we have an absolute jam-packed podcast, even more so than usual. So let's get straight into today's episode. Welcome to episode 209 of the Corporate Report podcast, Requiem for the Suicided, Danny Casalero. And unfortunately, this episode of Requiem for the Suicided, like every episode, begins with a tragic death. In West Virginia, authorities are investigating the mysterious death of a journalist and possible connections to the BCCI bank scandal and the Weapons for Iran case. Wyatt Andrews tells us that puzzling tale. Freelance journalist Danny Casolero told friends he was on to the political conspiracy of the century. He was meeting a source in West Virginia. He was about to discover all. Instead, his body was discovered in a hotel room with 12 slashes in his wrist. But when the local authorities ruled it suicide, the family said, no way. The housekeeper had taken calls threatening his life. And I pick it up telephone. I say, hello. And he said to me, you son of a bitch, you's dead. Despite that sounding straight from the movies, the medical examiner today held to the suicide finding, saying Casolero apparently was alone. There were no other contusions, lacerations, or other trauma to the body that would indicate a struggle. In my heart, I remember Danny telling us, if I'm in an accident, don't believe it. Casolero was probing a conspiracy he called the octopus, which involved the Iranian hostage crisis, the Iran-Contra affair, with, believe it or not, all funds channeled through BCCI, the international bank charged with everything from money laundering to fraud. Good afternoon. The common thread within octopus is the infamous Inslaw affair, when a court ruled the Reagan Justice Department stole valuable law enforcement software from the Inslaw Corporation. Casolero's theory is that right-wing zealots sold the software for profit. The money went to Iranian officials who supposedly delayed the release of the American hostages back in 1981, the so-called October Surprise, and later went to the back-channel funding of the Contras. It's wild, but so many affidavits partly supporting each thread of the theory have been filed in the Inslaw case that Inslaw's lawyer, former Attorney General Elliot Richardson, believes Casolero was close to something. And now we have the, with the death of Daniel Casolero, what I think is, is a, a new and even more compelling reason for a, a full investigation. Unknown to his family, Casolero suffered from MS. There was no publisher as yet committed to print his story. He was deeply in debt. And yet, either way, suicide or murder, investigators from both the House and the Senate are in line to see Casolero's notes. Wyatt Andrews, CBS News, Washington. Yes, yet another case of a journalist working on a politically sensitive topic and ending up dead in a hotel room. And unfortunately, I think we've seen this concatenation of events before, and unfortunately, I think we're likely to see it again in the future. 
But let's get a little bit more into this case and who Danny Casolaro was, and perhaps some in the audience are already familiar with Casolaro and his story. But for those who aren't, I'll suggest a few good sources that you can find online, including a Village Voice article from way back in 1991 by James Ridgway and Doug Vaughn called The Last Days of Danny Casolaro that goes into quite a bit of detail about his case. There's also an article called The Mysterious Death of Danny Casolaro by David McMichael, and let's just read a little bit from that article for a short synopsis of who Casolaro was and what he was working on. It says, Joseph Daniel Casolaro was one of many freelance investigative reporters stirring the witch's brew of scandals simmering in the nation's capital. He was also an aspiring novelist, newsletter publisher, and freelance writer for publications running the gamut from the now-defunct Washington Star to the National Enquirer. From a well-to-do family... His father, a doctor, had invested well in northern Virginia real estate. He was 44 years old, divorced, and living comfortably on a five-acre estate in Fairfax County, Virginia, home to the CIA. Casolero was working on a book aimed at exposing what he called the Octopus, a group of less than a dozen shadowy figures whose machinations figured heavily, he claimed, in the Inslaw case, Iran-Contra, BCCI, and the October Surprise. And we'll end that quotation there. I think that's the best short synopsis of what this is all about. And I'm sure that a lot of those names will ring some bells for the long-term listeners in the audience, including, of course, Iran-Contra, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with, and the October Surprise, where the uh, Iranian hostages were released just after Reagan won the nomination for president. And the BCCI scandal, of course, uh, reaching into all sorts of corridors. And we have touched on that, for example, in my conversations with Peter Dale Scott in the past. And then there's the Inslaw case. And I'm sure that a lot of you out there will already know something about this case, especially because I have at least mentioned it in episode 102 of this podcast on Know Your History, Iran-Contra, where we talked a little bit about the Inslaw octopus and an excellent Wired.com article that was written way back in 1993 by Richard Fricker on that case. An extremely, extremely interesting and important case that has, uh, well, it's, it's the tentacles of that octopus have reached far, far into our own time and into all sorts of different scandals. And we will have much, much more on that coming up, as you'll see. But first, I think it's important to establish the Casolero connection and what Casolero is really doing, because today's episode is about Danny Casolero, someone who I think, um, well, many people agree, gave his life for uh, trying to research further into this conspiracy and find out more about it. And there he was proclaiming that he had uh, cracked the nut and had the, had the goods on the political conspiracy of the century and ends up dead in a hotel room of alleged suicide. Well, for the best overview of this case in um, audio form, of course, the best overview in general comes from those articles that I cited earlier, but the best audio uh, documentary, I suppose, of what uh, we, we are looking at today comes from, of all places, an Unsolved Mysteries episode from way back in the early 1990s, hosted, of course, by Robert Stack. So let's listen to that episode of Unsolved Mysteries, where they go into the mystery of Danny Casolaro's death. Housekeeping! On what seemed like an ordinary Saturday afternoon in the summer of 1991, a housekeeper at the Sheraton Hotel opened room 517 for routine cleaning. Nothing could prepare her for what she found inside. Oh, God. Lying in a tub of bloody water was a guest registered to the room. Clearly, the man was dead. The housekeeper discovered the body of Danny Casalero, a 44-year-old investigative journalist from Fairfax, Virginia. Within minutes... Martinsburg police were called to investigate. In the room, they found a brief suicide note which read, To my loved ones, please forgive me, most especially my son, and be understanding. God will let me in. Hi, Tom. Lieutenant. What do you got here? Uh, Seems pretty clear it's a suicide. We got a note here. Got about a dozen slash marks on the wrist. In the bathtub, police recovered a single razor blade. Incredibly, Casalero's wrists were slashed 12 times, with eight cuts on his left wrist and four on his right. 
One cut was deep enough to sever a tendon. The reporter's wallet was found in his room with cash and credit cards intact. There appeared to be no evidence of a struggle. Why don't you uh, wrap it up here as quickly as you can and we'll get out of here. Good job. You got it. Casalera's body was delivered to a Martinsburg funeral home later Saturday afternoon. However, two days passed before Casalera's family was notified of his death. My mother called me and, you know, uh, she said, Danny's dead, they've killed him. And I called the police at that point. She didn't really know any details and spoke with the sergeant doing the investigation. Hi, this is Dr. Tony Casalero. I'm calling about Danny Casalero. Yes, I just spoke with the How can I help you? Yes. What happened? And he said, we found your brother and he committed suicide. Suicide. The hotel maid found his body when she went in to clean his room on Saturday around 1 o'clock. Uh, Saturday? This is Monday. I asked them why it had taken them two days to notify us, and he, he at the moment didn't know. He just said he thought we had already been notified. Uh, sir, no. Uh, look, what do you know about my brother? I started asking questions. What about all the papers he had with him, the investigation he was doing, and the, and the sergeant was clearly, really didn't have any idea about this. And at that point told me they found no papers in his room. The papers Casalero had with him in Martinsburg included hundreds of notes and documents for more than a year of investigation. Not one has ever been found. From the moment we heard about his reported suicide, we uh, doubted it, questioned it, wondered about it. It was not his nature to kill himself, so we were suspicious from the first. And then the deeper we dug into it, the more suspicious we became. Suspicious circumstances uh, surrounding the investigation of his alleged suicide. Danny Casalero's fear of blood tests and other minor medical procedures was well known to his family. They found it incomprehensible that he committed suicide by slashing his wrists a dozen times. Just days before his death, Danny Casalero enthusiastically told friends he was close to breaking the story that had consumed him the past year. It had started as an inquiry into computer software theft, but soon mushroomed into a broad investigation of government corruption that Casalero believed implicated U.S. Justice Department officials. Many suspect that Casalero was silenced because he had found out too much. Danny Casalero's strange odyssey began when he interviewed Bill and Nancy Hamilton, the owners of a computer software company called Inslaw. First of all, when was the Promise software developed and what was it for? Well, there's a big need for this kind of software. The Hamiltons had developed a powerful program called Promise that they claimed revolutionized information management by law enforcement agencies. In 1980, the U.S. Justice Department purchased the Inslaw software to handle their millions of case files. Initially, the program earned high praise and handsome returns for Inslaw. Then the climate of justice suddenly changed. What we'll do first is bring up a menu. At the beginning of the second year of the three-year contract, the Justice Department began to withhold payments from Inslaw. And they uh, withheld a couple of million dollars from Inslaw drove his law into Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The Hamiltons then discovered that the Canadian government had acquired their software, despite the fact that Inslaw had never sold the program to Canada. What sort of funny things started happening? The Hamiltons told Casalero that they were mystified by illegal sales of their software until they spoke to a man named Michael Riconosciuto. He claimed to have worked for the CIA on numerous top-secret projects. Rick Conosciuto agreed to talk to Unsolved Mysteries about the unauthorized use of Inslaw software by clandestine agencies. Well, the parties that were involved in the uh, distribution of this software uh, were involved in covert operations. And they were involved in uh, uh, Nicaragua and Central America. And they were involved in uh, operations in the Middle East. And, uh, yes, I have direct knowledge of... Uh, funds uh, from the sale of uh, this product uh, being used uh, to finance those operations. As early as August of 1989, the brewing Inslaw scandal had drawn the attention of Congress and the House Judiciary Committee opened a formal inquest. 
The report describes the committee's investigation into serious allegations that high-level Department of Justice officials were involved in a criminal conspiracy to force Inslaw, a small computer company, out of business. Steal his Michael Riconosciuto began telling his story to committee investigators. Within a week of submitting his sworn affidavit to the committee, Riconosciuto was arrested on drug charges by agents of the Justice Department. He is currently being held in federal custody in Chicago, Illinois. While the drug conviction taints Reconosciuto's credibility, the committee also heard from a witness with impeccable credentials, Elliot Richardson. Now legal counsel for the Hamiltons, Richardson was attorney general under Richard Nixon. In 1973, Richardson had resigned rather than participate in the Watergate cover-up. There is simply too much to be ignored. In the case of Inslaw, there's a a spreading radius of circumstantial evidence which at its outer reaches entails a, a far more sinister kind of conspiracy than anything revealed in Watergate. Do you have any information as to whether or not they acquired the promised software? After months of investigation, Casalera believed he had uncovered an unsavory network of U.S. officials, organized crime members, and intelligence agents. He called it the octopus. System, or is that being used by their intelligence operations? Casalero claimed the octopus was at the root of not only the Inslaw affair, but the Iran Contra scandal, BCCI, BNL, and even the now largely discredited October Surprise. In short, just about every major scandal of the 1980s. Yeah, for direct connections with some of the underworld crime figures. Now. The deeper Casalera went in search of the octopus, the more he found himself on intimate terms with shadowy characters. Danny Casalero stepped into a world that he didn't belong in. Uh, the type of people that he became involved with um, lie just as a matter of, of course. Uh, I think after a while, they don't even know what the real truth is. Uh, they lie, they cheat. There are people who have been involved in numerous murders, dealing drugs, dealing arms. And Danny Casalero thought he could find his way through this labyrinth by himself. And that was a mistake. Are you serious? I don't know. I don't think so. A week before he died, Casalero told his brother he had been receiving frequent death threats. Who are these guys? Well, I don't know. I mean, I know a couple of them. They're the guys that I've been working with, my contacts. And they're calling me and saying, look, Danny, you're getting too close. You're going to get hurt. Back off. And I'm getting calls in the middle of the night from guys I've never heard of. I don't recognize their voices. I don't know where they're coming from. They're just saying, you are going to die. <laughs> I'll tell you this, though. When I go to Martinsburg, if something happens to me or if I should get hurt, don't believe it's an accident. With briefcases full of notes and documents, Casalero arrived in Martinsburg to meet with several informants and conclude his investigation. He had been tracking the finances of the octopus and believed one of his new contacts would deliver key evidence. Danny had a source there inside the IRS's uh, computer data center that was giving him uh, hard copy printouts of uh, uh, IRS information on certain specific targets that Danny was after. William Turner? And you are? Danny Casalero? Get in. The day before he died, Casalero met with another source, William Turner, a former employee of a major defense contractor. You have some documentation? You have some for me? Driver's license. According to Turner, he handed over paperwork documenting corruption that Casalero believed was tied to the octopus. Within 24 hours, Casalero would be found dead, and Turner's documents would disappear along with the rest of Casalero's papers. In response to the controversy surrounding Casalero's death, authorities in West Virginia convened a formal inquest, including a complete autopsy. The assistant medical examiner for the state of West Virginia, he said, well, you know, um, he's already been embalmed, and that's going to make it a little difficult. And I said, what are you talking about? He's already been embalmed. 
And he said, well, he was embalmed uh, apparently already. He said, you didn't know that? I said, absolutely not. I said, we didn't give any permission. I said, is that how it's what's supposed to happen? He said, no, that's not. He said, but we'll just have to look into that. I'm now going to cut the sutures to examine the wounds. The autopsy confirmed that bleeding from the 12 razor cuts had resulted in Danny Casalero's death. More importantly, the autopsy disclosed evidence suggesting Casalero may not have been alone in the hotel room during the final moments of his life. Six cuts on the flexor surface of the left wrist. I was told there were no signs of any struggle. There was, on the actual autopsy report, described a bruise on the arm and a bruise on the head, which were never accounted for. Uh, additionally, the tips of three fingernails were missing from one hand. You know, the other things, the embalming, the whatever, you think, well, you know, things can happen and just accept things. But this, they did not tell us the truth. He had bruises on him. Casalero's hotel room had been cleaned the day after his death by a professional cleaning crew, and the workers inadvertently discarded important evidence. The previous day, minutes after Casalero's body had been found, one of the Sheraton housekeepers noticed two bloody towels in the bathroom. They appeared to have been used to wipe blood off the bathroom floor. The question of who tried to clean up the floor with the towels has never been addressed by West Virginia authorities. The police reports of the investigation are certainly not professional. Fingerprints get lost, messed up. They drain the tub without a strainer. Sloppy work. What were the towels doing underneath the sink? The police did not check them. Police have a rule in this country, and government people have a rule. When they screw up, they cover up. Sad but true. Do I think they covered up here? Yes, I do. There is enough evidence that he was murdered so that there should have been a much more intensive investigation than there has been. I don't know enough to know for sure, but all that I do know makes me believe that it was more likely that he was murdered than that he committed suicide. Our brother Danny Casalero has gone to his rest in the peace of Christ with faith and hope in eternal life even Casalero's funeral was clouded by mystery. And assist him with our... As a ceremony was drawing to a close, a highly decorated military officer arrived in a limousine. It was really unusual because I noticed this tall, stoic-looking black man in full military dress standing there with this, like, plain-clothes type of guy. Just before the casket was lowered into the ground, the military man carefully placed a medal on the casket lid. And we went back to Francis's house, Danny's mother's house, and I said, Francis, who was, who was the, the military man? And she said, I thought you'd know. Don't you know that guy? And I said, no. And we asked everyone there. There had to be 50 people at Francis' house. No one knew who they were. No one. West Virginia authorities and Department of Justice representatives declined to participate in this broadcast. Casalero's family and friends are convinced he did not commit suicide. The official inquiry into Casalero's death was concluded more than a year ago. However, Casalero's clothing, wallet, suicide note, and other personal items have been retained with no explanation by the investigators. So there is the unsolved mystery. On the one hand, we have a simple suicide with a note, no signs of struggle or contusions or anything else, with some sloppy investigative and police work after the fact, but really nothing to get concerned about. On the other hand, we have a murder that was perpetrated for the purposes of keeping whatever was in Danny Casalero's notes from coming to the attention of the public. Is it really undecidable which, which one is the case? Well, for even more on this story and the very, very odd nature of Danny Casalero's death, we're going to turn to an excerpt from an 
excellent uh, interview that I would like to commend to your attention. And of course, I will put in the link to the full interview in the documentation notes. So I certainly hope that you'll give it a listen. It's a really, really in-depth two and a half hour conversation between my good friend James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com and Albert Lanier, a uh, freelance journalist, about the Danny Casalero case and the Inslaw octopus and how all of this ties in. We're going to be listening to a short excerpt from that two and a half hour in-depth conversation, just talking about the very strange nature of Casalero's death and uh, all of the, the things that just don't add up to a regular suicide. So let's take a listen to that conversation. Now, when Casalero was found, he was found in room 517 of the Sheridan, I think Martinsburg Inn, I think that's the formal name of it. His body was found in the bathroom. Now, it was a tub that was basically a blood, you know, blood, bloody water. So he's found in a tub of bloody water. There supposedly was not only blood on the floor, which was a tile floor, but also on the wall. The reason why I point this out is that Casalero's friends and family say that he was squeamish about blood. He didn't even want to get uh, a blood test. He was supposed to get a blood test for um, uh, some of some something, of which, I, uh, which is, keeps my mind at the point. But he was supposed to get blood test. He was very squeamish about blood and uh, about blood test. Um, I think even his um, his brother Tony has said this. Uh, his brother is a physician. Uh, Casalero's dad was also a doctor. He was an obstetrician, from what I understand. So they would they would probably know if he was squeamish about okay. blood. That's one of the strongest things from everything that I've read, even from the profiles on Unsolved Mysteries. People can check out online. Uh, and um, the uh, Current Affair, which is also online. People can go to YouTube and check those out. Um, and I recommend they do. That's one of the strongest things that emerge is, in terms of the details of Casalero's life, is that he was squeamish about blood. So, you have a man in a blood-filled tub of water, blood on the floor and blood on the wall. My understanding is there were also bloody towels that were on the floor. Those were later disposed of, from what I understand. So, Casalero's body was discovered, I believe, by a maid at the hotel. She called, I think, a maintenance man, and he looked into it, and then they called the police. And they came in. Now, Casalero's body had about 12 cuts. Or should I say, his arms had 12 cuts. Not his wrist, his arms. I believe there was eight. Um, let me see here. Um, I think you had eight on one arm and you had about four on the other. At least one of the cuts sliced into the tendon. That means that it went beyond the skin, you know, tendons over the bone, right? So if it sliced beneath the skin and into the tendon, it's a, it's a strong cut. So... Basically, razor, yeah. Right, how, would, how would someone that squeamish slash the hell out of themselves so deep they're cutting tendons, you know, right. a, do, a dozen times? Interesting detail number one. Why would somebody who's afraid of blood tests, as you mentioned, squeamish, why would they cut themselves? Why would they commit suicide in such a manner? To me, this is one of the first details, or I call it interesting details of this case that don't quite jive. Well, I was going to say there's also, yeah, notes of you mentioned the towels that almost looked as though someone had kind of, you know how you throw a towel down and use your foot to, mm -hmm. to wipe something up as if something right. had been moved around. Right. So basically the murder scene is completely suspicious. Well, the official, uh, remember what the... Um, the police in Martinsburg classified it as a suicide. Mm -hmm. Now, which, which sounds like something out of Arkansas, where folks die of right. you know laying on train tracks, or and it's you know ruled suicide. Oh, oh 
yes. Uh, but yes. that's that's uh, a whole the, other that's a whole other that's a whole other case. I'm familiar with that case, but that's a whole other case. But in this case, uh, that, see, that's why I mentioned the blood. See, you have this blood from what I've read. You had blood, not only bloody water in the tub, but on the floor, the wall. Again, the interesting detail, all these cuts. That's just, so we've got those details. Now then, here's another aspect. The body was found, obviously the police came, they took it away. Um, the body was, I believe, um, looked over, um, examined. What happened is the body ended up being embalmed. Now, the body's found on a Saturday. The, the relatives of Danny Casalero are informed on Monday. So a couple of days, nearly a couple of days go by. By this time, Danny Casalero's body, which was, uh, I believe, sent to the Brown Funeral Hall in Martinsburg, was embalmed, I believe. So it was embalmed at the Brown Funeral Hall. Now here's interesting detail number two. Why, why is it that a body which has just recently been not only discovered but removed from the, the, the site of death, supposedly, why would it then be embalmed in, in less than a couple of days? I mean, this is a violation of West Virginia law. If this was supposedly your average suicide or your average death in a place like Martinsburg or any other place, why would you wait, why would you rush to embalm? Why would you rush to even mess with the body and preserve it in that sort of state? Why would there be a need for that? The family didn't get permission. In fact, they weren't even notified until Monday. By that time, he'd already been embalmed. Mm -hmm. And the family, again, has said they've, they've found it incomprehensible that he would kill himself this way because he was squeamish. Right. And it's this then sounds like cleaning up a, a crime scene illegally. Right. right. See, that's the it. And here's another point. There was a professional cleaning crew, from what I understand, that went into the hotel and cleaned that room. In the meantime, all of these potential clues whether it's clues that would lead to suicide or lead to murder, however you want to look at it, they were tossed out, thrown out in the course of this cleaning. They went through the room, they cleaned it. I think John Connolly had mentioned on the original Unsolved Mysteries uh, segment that, uh, and I had read his spy magazine uh, investigation into the death of Danny Casalero, that they had not used a strainer, I believe, to, <laughs> to drain the water. Um, it, I mean, when you look at the details of this, it's, it's simply just surprising. Um, and then, I haven't even mentioned the suicide, the so-called suicide note. Mm hmm Yes. Um, let me see. Now, this, the so-called suicide note, uh, he had basically, there was a, uh, let me see here, there was a page written out of a, uh, a note, notepad. And this is what it read, at least I can read my notes here. To those who I love the most, please forgive me for the worst possible thing I could have done. Most of all, sorry to my son. Uh, I know deep down that God will let me in. Now, my understanding is that Casalero was not religious and that his style of writing was a bit more on the flowery or wordy side. Friends, yeah, friends have actually described him. He wasn't an investigative journalist. Danny was a poet. And so this last note is very flat and very mm -hmm. religious. Yeah, and that last line is, I know deep down inside that God will yeah. let me in. Yes, I know deep down inside that God will let me in. Yeah, interesting detail number three, um, at least for me. Uh, so we have... 10 to 12 cuts on his arm, one of which, it, one at least one that could sever a tendon. We have the fact that his body was embalmed after it was removed and before his family was notified. And we have his suicide note, which 
a chord which as you clearly state is written in a kind of flat tone uh, not befitting someone who has uh, had far more literary aspirations obviously as a writer than this would imply and who was supposedly not religious uh, at least from what I've read um, all of this seems to indicate that things are not what they seem to put it mildly in this case and then you have the autopsy, uh, which I believe was performed at the University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And in the autopsy, um, my understanding is that some, um, I think there was a little alcohol that was found. Um, but you also had antidepressants in Casolaro's system. Now, my understanding is that he had no prescription for these antidepressants. Um, or at least um, there, w there hasn't been any evidence that I'm aware of. Nothing's turned up that implies that he was, you know, taking this on prescription. Um, also in the autopsy, there was a bruise on his head, and I believe there was also a bruise on his arm. And my and my and I also understand that his nails were possibly broken. And, and uh, according to the unsolved mystery segment, the original one, the tops of his uh, fingers uh, were were gone. Uh, the tops of at least three fingers on one hand were gone. So, like the very very top tip top of his of his fingers, I gather, were gone. So uh, my understanding is that his nails were not examined, um, looked at for tissue that would indicate whether he had fought anyone or grabbed any skin underneath. Because if you fight someone, perhaps he, you know, you if you you know get a good grab, struggle, you know, a struggle. Pull. Yeah. Yeah. If there were a struggle, they'd grab some skin. Right. Nothing like that. Um, also, he had, so that's another, you could call it interesting detail number four, uh, or details number four. Um, also, the fact that he had supposedly uh, symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Uh, and this is seen as a, uh, a reason for his suicide. Now, it's a plausible reason. I'll, I'll grant that. It's a plausible reason. But there's no indication that he exhibited any symptoms of MS, at least at the time that he was alive. And I guess I would call this, it would be what, interesting detail number five? We have to five now? Mm -hmm. So here we have the death of Danny Casolaro, and I've just mentioned the details. Right. Well, and I, that's, I was going to say that we've, we've now, we've kind of discussed all the interesting things that were found at the scene, but maybe let's, let's move to what wasn't found at the scene. Right. His notes. His papers. Supposedly, I think he had packed up a, a black bag. And uh, Black Bag had a lot of his notes and his papers. Uh, all the notes and papers that he had brought with him to the hotel. Uh, that he, I guess, that was, uh, that, that dealt with the octopus, that dealt perhaps maybe with Inslaw or various aspects of Inslaw. They were gone. Uh, they weren't there in the hotel. Uh, and certainly the police said that they didn't know anything about any such papers. They didn't recover any. They weren't there, according to the police. Um, so that's also very significant. That's another very significant detail. His papers were gone. Missing. So that begs the question, you know, obviously, who took them? We don't know. So when you add up all of these factors, it results in a very strange occurrence, to put it mildly. Interesting details, indeed. Well, once again, I will commend that interview to your attention so that you listen to it in its entirety, where James and Albert get into even more detail about the case and how it connects into the Inslaw octopus. But suffice it to say that the common reasons that are given for a possible suicide by Danny Casolaro just do not hold up to scrutiny. The idea that this person committed suicide because he had been diagnosed with MS, which he was showing no symptoms of yet, 
It, well, in some in some cases, that holds some credibility. But in this case, are we expected to believe that as he was working on this novel and just about to finish it and was clearly excited about this and telling people about his research, and he goes all the way to Virginia with a bunch of his papers, in fact, all of the notes and, and drafts of the novel that he'd been working on all this time, to do meetings to finish up the, the final draft of, of this book, and he goes to a hotel room in the middle of Virginia to commit suicide because of MS, and then all of his papers are somehow missing. Again, that just does not add up. Also, the idea that he had been in monetary troubles and thus took his life because of that also does not add up when one realizes that he was uh, living on a five-acre estate, which he was in the process of selling, uh, which would have provided several hundred thousand dollars worth of funds right there. Plus, he was employing a full-time housekeeper, so it's not like he was in dire financial straits at that exact moment at any rate. So again, the reasons commonly given for why he might have done this just do not add up. And all of the suspicious circumstances combined with the fact that all of his notes and all of the things that he was working on at the time went missing after his death. Well, I think we can all see that this adds up to something much more sinister. And on that note, let's, I suppose it's time that we actually start taking a, an investigation into what it was that he was working on. And again, I have talked about the Inslaw octopus before on this podcast, but I think we need to flesh it out in further detail and bring us all up to speed on what's going on here. So in order to do that, I think one of the best synopses of what this is really all about came from, of all places, Australia whose Nine Network produces a program called A Current Affair, a news journal show that airs in Australia. And in the early 1990s, they had uh, an investigative report into this case, including, of course, details of Danny Casolaro's death. So let's take a listen to this report from Australia's Nine Network all the way back from the early 1990s. Hello, thanks for joining us. Tonight, the international spy scandal with an Australian connection, and later we'll talk to South Africa's Foreign Minister, Pick Borter, a man on a mission to improve relations between Canberra and Pretoria. It's a spy scandal that's already rocked the White House, an intrigue that could threaten the presidency of George Bush. This story centers on incredible allegations of spying on a scale never before imagined. It involves America's Central Intelligence Agency selling computer programs to foreign nations. These programs allegedly allowed the CIA to spy on the intelligence agencies that bought it. And one of the purchases was Australia. We've been able to track down two key witnesses to those dealings, witnesses who are now in fear of their lives. Michael Holmes reports. It may be the most bizarre spy story ever. A story of corruption and betrayal at the highest levels of the American government. A story of hostages used as pawns. Of the CIA spying on its friends. Of murders made to look like suicides. I think it's about time to get the whole story out. His name is Ari ben Menashe. He's a former Israeli intelligence agent. Once it's out, there's no reason to hurt me physically anymore. And today, he is hiding in Australia, in fear, he says, of his life. So many people in the last 10 years who were working for the various governments on these issues, due to cover-ups, died mysteriously. He claims the United States tried to spy on ASIO, the Australian Security Intelligence Organization, by selling it a computer program that contained a hidden keyhole, a lock for which the CIA had a master key. The computer software is called Promise. It's designed to track millions of pieces of information on tens of thousands of people. And it's alleged to have been installed in dozens of government departments and security agencies around the world. It's also alleged that American intelligence made some small modifications to the program 
modifications that enabled it to key in a special access code and gain entry to all the information on the computer. It would be equivalent to going into ASIO or ASIO and reading the handwritten files of all the agents except the computer has them neatly organized and typed and instantly indexed so it's much more convenient. Bill Hamilton owns Inslaw, the company that developed Promise and offered it to the American government. They would not have bothered to sell it to all these countries without first preparing it in such a way that it would be an easier avenue of penetration into the files of these foreign governments. The whole story might never have emerged but for the fact that the American government didn't own Promise. It pirated the software from Bill Hamilton's company. We were dumbfounded. Couldn't conceive of it. Hamilton's contract with the U.S. Department of Justice to supply the Promise software was cancelled in 1982 without any real explanation. Only some time later did Hamilton hear that his software was turning up all over the world. I don't know how much Australia paid. I've been told that Israel paid 5.5 million. Ari ben Menashe confirms that Promise was sold to Israel, but claims the Israelis, unlike the Australians, were in on the secret. The whole idea was that we would study it, the Americans then would sell it to our neighbours, and then we could, by using telephone lines, get into their, uh, our neighbours' computers. But then our American friends just took it a step further. They s sold it to their allies as well, including Australia. The list of countries which allegedly bought the Promise software reads like a who's who of America's friends, as well as its most bitter enemies. Is spy on your friends uh, considered you know, a fair thing to do in the intelligence world? Oh, it is. It's always done. Um, using a Trojan horse to go inside the agency, that gets a little aggressive. You know? It all sounds a bit too bizarre to be true, but we've now been able to track down a key witness to a prison near Seattle in Washington State. So you are 100% sure that Promise or a derivative of Promise was bought by Australia to be used in our intelligence and law enforcement agencies? Absolutely, uh, because I, I uh, uh, spent uh, several thousand man hours of uh, programming time with a programming team, uh, you know, developing that subset. This unlikely looking character is a computer genius. His name is Michael Riconosciuto, and he says he was in charge of modifying the Promise program so that it could be accessed by American intelligence. So whoever was holding that master key could do what? Basically uh, break into it and spy. ASIO says it doesn't have and has never had the promised software. Of course, it won't go into any detail about what sort of computer programs it does have, which is very handy because, according to Michael Riconosciuto, the promised software was often altered and given different names before it was sold. Indeed, Riconosciuto claims he specifically modified the program for Australia at the request of ASIO. I basically had to change the communications protocol, which is how that software package interacts with other software packages already resident in the computer system. In a federal court hearing, Judge well, George seven, Basin five. ruled the Justice Department had used illegal no, and well, underhanded methods seven. to bankrupt Bill Hamilton's Inslaw company. He ordered the government to pay in law eight million dollars. Yeah. Trickery, fraud and deceit. You use those words when describing how the Justice Department stole the software. Do you stand by those words? Yes. I, there's no question in my mind about it. Uh, the evidence was overwhelming. So why was the Justice Department so desperate to get the software from Bill Hamilton? To answer that, you have to go back to 1980. Iran had seized American hostages. All evidence proves that these people are spies. If President Carter could secure their release, he'd have a big advantage in the upcoming U.S. elections. My thoughts and my prayers for our hostages in Iran are as though they were my own sons and daughters. 
It's now alleged that the Reagan campaign made a deal with the Iranians, a deal to keep the hostages until after the election, thus denying Carter the credit for their freedom. The man alleged to have helped organise this deal is a Reagan political crony called Earl Bryan, and his payoff three years later on the promised software. About an hour and a half outside Washington DC you'll find this place, Earl Bryan's multi-million dollar country estate. If you believe Michael Reconosciuto, it's the house Promise bought. Now we'd like to bring you Earl Bryan personally denying that claim, but he's not being interviewed by anybody. All we got was this letter from his lawyers, threatening action if we so much as associate Earl Bryan's name with this story. He had the contacts to help make sure that certain elements in Iran would not make a deal with President Carter in 1980 so that President Carter could not recover in the polls and that Reagan would win the election. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that Just I... Just five minutes after Ronald Reagan took the oath of office, Iran announced that the hostages would be released. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free. And the story doesn't end there. In a moment, the murders that have been linked to the spy scandal. There are many shady characters in this story. Spies, former spies, people with something to hide. But there are players with impeccable credentials too. In part two of this investigation, we meet a man whose background more than qualifies him to know a scandal when he smells one. What is being said about this conspiracy points to criminal conduct much worse than anything in Watergate. And Elliot Richardson should know. 17 years ago, he resigned as U.S. Attorney General on a matter of principle after clashing with Richard Nixon during the Watergate scandal. Today, Richardson is legal counsel for Inslaw, and once again, he has the White House in his sights. It might be reluctant to, to have it emerge that you, the U.S. government had, through uh, clandestine means, planted uh, software on foreign intelligence agencies so that the U.S. would be better able, as the phrase goes, to read their mail. The number of uh, murders that have occurred uh, to uh, prevent uh, leaks uh, are incredible. There's nearly 50 murders that can be directly ascribed uh, to this pattern of activity. The Promise Affair and the allegation that Ronald Reagan and George Bush made a deal for the hostages to be kept until after the 1980 election were being investigated by journalist and author Danny Casolaro. He said he had it. He had some already and he was going to West Virginia to meet the source who had given him that evidence. This source was now, he said, going to supply additional conclusive proof. But Danny Castellaro never got to reveal either his source or the hard evidence he said was going to break the scandal wide open. On August the 10th, his body was found in this hotel room in West Virginia. His wrists had been slashed an incredible 12 times. Danny Castellaro's body was found naked in a pool of bloody water in the bathtub. All his papers were gone. Within hours, local police had declared the death a suicide. You have a, a case of forensic artistry, you know, shall we say, where you have professionally trained people that set up a crime scene and they make it phenomenally difficult for investigators to, uh, to backtrack, make a murder look like a suicide. His body was embalmed by Monday morning by the time we found out. That is against the law in West Virginia. His body was embalmed without family consent. That certainly makes an autopsy a little more difficult. Tony Casolaro says his brother Danny, pictured here at a nephew's birthday, 
just wasn't the suicidal type. He was describing for me a few weeks before he died what he was doing and some of the people involved. And he said uh, a lot of accidents had happened to people who were working on the things that he had been working on. He said, you know, if an accident happens to me, don't believe it. But bad things seem to happen to people who make waves in the Inslaw affair. Earlier this year, Michael Riconosciuto contacted Bill Hamilton and signed a sworn affidavit for Hamilton's lawsuit against the Justice Department. Do you believe Michael Riconosciuto did alter the software as he claimed he did? Yes, I, I do. Almost immediately, Riconosciuto was contacted by a Justice Department official and given a very clear message. Back off or else. Less than two weeks after that threat, Michael Riconosciuto was arrested on drug charges. My main concern right now is staying alive and protecting my family. Right. And remember Judge Basin, who found in favour of Inslaw against the Justice Department. Right. Well, a few months later, Judge Basin's reappointment to the bench, thought to be a formality, was blocked by the Justice Department. Yeah. His career has been destroyed. Would you still be a judge if you hadn't handed down the decision you did? I think I would be. I rendered the, quote, wrong decision in uh, the case of Inslaw versus uh, Department of Justice. Your replacement in the bankruptcy court was a lawyer who argued for the Justice Department in this case. Yes. It, does that smell? Is that worthy it's, of... it's certainly an odd coincidence, isn't it? Every time you figuratively pick up a rock, in this case, you find maggots under it. Michael Holmes reporting on the saga that is now the subject of a U.S. congressional inquiry. Next up, South Africa's... Maggots under every rock, exactly. Well, that, of course, was Bill Hamilton, the owner of Inslaw, who, of course, had his promise software stolen by the Justice Department, something that was ruled upon in a court, court of law, but, of course, uh, the wheels of justice served to overturn that ruling. But at any rate, that is an incredibly important and somewhat complex story. So before we get too much into that particular aspect of all of this, Let's just reflect on something that we just heard in the at the end of that report where they indicated that this is this uh, case has been tied not only to the mysterious death of Danny Casalero but to as one of the people involved in that report said over 50 cases of death can be tied back to this Inslaw octopus scandal and that is exactly what we want to pick up next in this thread, in this web of deception that's going on here. And in order to do that, we'll turn to an article from tvnewslies.org titled Exposing the Labyrinth of Institutionalized Crime in the United States, The Promise Software Scandal, which reads in part, quote, On September 27, 1994, the U.S. Department of Justice released a 187-page report on Inslaw's allegations. 62 pages of which were exclusively devoted to the death of Danny Casalero. On pages 166-167 of the DOJ report, it noted, quote, During forensic testing, the West Virginia State Police Crime Laboratory found a folded piece of paper inside Mr. Casalero's left shoe. The shoe had been found in room 517 next to the bed. The writing was Mr. Casalero's, end quote. The documents and briefcase that Casalero took to Mitt Martinburg were missing and never recovered, but the note hidden in his shoe contained an outline for a chapter of his book, Behold a Pale Horse. The outline on the piece of paper read as follows. Chapter on 1980. Terrorist Underground, Afghanistan, Mideast, Iran. John Philip Nichols after arrival. Indian Reservation. Fred Alvarez. Paul Maraska. Philip Arthur Dempson, Thompson, Fresno Hercules, Bill Kilpatrick, The Big Tex, Ricono, San Francisco, finish up chapter with Paul M. and Fred A. Ord. There was no indication why Casalero had put this piece, piece of paper inside his shoe, but the last words on the note clearly revealed where his investigation had ended, i.e. finish up chapter with Paul Maraska and Fred Alvarez. And we'll leave that quote there. 
But let's turn to the next part of this unfolding saga, which, again, the tentacles reach far and wide into the past and into our present. So let's pick up that part of the story with this report from KESQ News from 2008. It's a story you will only see on News Channel 3 at 11. Department of Justice officials were involved in a criminal conspiracy to force inflow a small computer company out of business. A top secret government computer program comes back to haunt the U.S. Tonight, you'll see how that program is now being connected to multiple local murder cases. It's 11 o'clock, time for news. Now, from the desert's news leader... KESQ News Channel 3 HD at 11. Hello, I'm Tamara DeMonte. And I'm John White. There are new developments tonight in a year-long News Channel 3 investigation. The Riverside County Sheriff's Department is looking into possible connections between a triple murder back in 1981 and a murder-suicide in 2005 that claimed six lives. It's a story you will only see right here on News Channel 3 at 11. The reporter, Nathan Baca. John Tamer, we have internal documents from the Cold Case Division of the Riverside County Sheriff's Department showing the depth of the investigation. We will not reveal the investigator's identity at this time since the documents show their lives may be in danger. Now we are learning the murders may be a cover-up for one of the federal government's most secret computer programs. Promise is the name of one of the government's most secret computer database programs. Computer programmer Michael Riconosciuto wrote in this affidavit that major modifications to the program were made here in India. On July 1st, 1981, Fred Alvarez, his girlfriend Patty Castro, and friend Ralph Boger were shot to death here on Bob Hope Drive in Rancho Mirage. There was a house here that has since been bulldozed. Nobody was ever arrested for the shooting. Family friends say Cabazon Band of Mission Indians Vice Chairman Fred Alvarez was going to blow the whistle on this. Documents from the early 1980s showing a business partnership between defense contractor Wackenhut Services and Cabazon manager John Philip Nichols to form Cabazon Arms. One of their alleged projects was the Promise Computer Program. Database and pattern recognition software was a new source of information and power in the early 1980s. It starts when the program's designers, Inslaw Corporation, accused the U.S. Justice Department of stealing the software for their own foreign policy purposes. This programmer testified he altered the program to create what's called a back door to allow government spying. This happened while working on Cabazon Indian sovereign land. Well, the parties that were involved in the uh, distribution of this software uh, were involved in covert operations. And they were involved in uh, uh, Nicaragua and Central America. And they were involved in uh, operations in the Middle East. This U.S. Justice Department memo from 1985 shows the Promise software was being sold to Middle Eastern arms dealers and wanted no paperwork or customs inspections to interfere. Even unsolved mysteries got on the case when the last journalist to investigate this spy scandal was found dead in his hotel room. Danny Casalero's wrists were slashed in 1991. It was ruled a suicide. But his reporter notes disappeared, and the book on the conspiracy he was to title Indio was never finished. Congressional hearings were held in 1992. It describes the committee's investigation into serious allegations that high-level Department of Justice officials were involved in a criminal conspiracy to force Inslaw, a small computer company, out of business. The hearings ended inconclusively. The Promise software was allegedly altered on tribal land in India with a lack of federal oversight. And just like Microsoft Windows, the database program kept up with the times, upgraded several times over the years. But Promise came back to haunt America in ways never imagined. Now, a disturbing indication that Robert Hansen, the FBI man accused of spying for the Russians in what officials said at the time of his arrest was a massive security breach, ended up helping Osama bin Laden. As correspondent Carl Cameron reports, Hansen sold the Russians an extremely sensitive piece of U.S. technology, and the indications are that they, in turn, sold it to bin Laden's al-Qaeda terrorist network. From an office in India to foreign capitals all over the world, several murder investigations are connected to this spy scandal. Whether answers can still be found 27 years later remains in the hands of the sheriff's cold case squad. 
The internal documents we've obtained and confidential interviews we've done reveal the Riverside County Sheriff's cold case squad is investigating whether DA investigator David McGowan was on this 27-year-old murder case before his 2005 death. We are still looking into whether they've concluded that angle of their questioning. Now, if you have missed any part of this 31-part exclusive investigation, more than one year in the making, log on to our website at KESQ.com. On the right-hand side, click on Special Reports, and then the icon that says Inside the DA's Office and DHS, please. John Tamer, we are looking into more answers, and uh, right now the Camazon Band of Mission Indians still have not responded to our questions uh, at this point. Okay, you're at part 31 of this investigation. Where is it going next? Well, the next part we look forward to doing is uh, revealing a little bit more of the confidential information, the internal documents, uh, very chilling information where a detective is basically saying that they cannot look uh, their wife in the eyes and tell her that they are w willing to risk the life of their family by pursuing this case. So they're basically asking to get off the case. A lot more on that coming up very soon. Why won't the DA's office say whether or not David McGowan was looking into this? Their official stance is that David McGowan was not looking into this. That is their official stance, according to their spokespeople. But at this point, uh, there have been a lot of questions that have been asked. Uh, friends and partners of uh, David McGowan have been asked questions about what cases he was working on before the 2005 deaths. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Thank you. If you're starting to get the impression that this case is much, much bigger than we all at first believed, then you are exactly right. And we have really only begun to scratch the surface of this topic, amazingly enough. So, we are going to do something that we've never done before in the Corbett Report. We're going to leave it there, but to pick it up next week in the first ever two-part episode of the Corbett Report podcast. And we're going to be in search of the octopus next week, where we start to get really in-depth into the Inslaw octopus case and the players behind it. And let me use this opportunity, of course, to say what does not need to be said, but has to be said on the record at any rate, that of course I value my life dearly, and I have absolutely no plans of ever committing suicide or anything of that sort. A caveat that might seem unnecessary at, at some point, but uh, unfortunately, as we see with people like Casalero and oh so many others that we've looked at in previous episodes of this podcast, something that needs to be put clearly on the record because unfortunately, people who investigate these types of things have a nasty habit of having bad things happening to them. And if anything happens to myself, of course, do not believe it. And on that note, we are going to continue this investigation next week. So let's leave it there. I am James Corbett, thanking you for joining me, and hoping you'll join me again next week for another edition of The Corbett Report. <laughs>